Warwick Castle. Born in the storm of the Norman invasion, its history is etched in steel and blood. This magnificent citadel was home to three chivalrous knights. Two would battle their way to England's throne. Relive the fighting past of the world's finest standing medieval stronghold. Next on Great Castles of Europe. England, 1066. A flotilla of Norman warships bears down on the Sussex coast. On board, 8,000 invaders steel themselves for battle, led by William, Duke of Normandy. Torn down and stowed inside their Viking-style ships is the decisive military weapon of its age. William will order it erected upon his army's landing in England, a simple castle consisting of a tower and courtyard. As the Duke's armies drive north against the Saxon king, Harold II, they subdue the countryside with dozens of these simple forts. Canterbury, Rochester, London, Windsor. By 1068, castles marked the conqueror's path to victory and changed the English landscape forever. One castle in the nation's heartland evolved into the towering epitome of defensive architecture, Warwick Castle. With its back thrust majestically against the Avon River, Warwick resembles a gladiator in repose, confidently welcoming all comers. It dominates a landscape of rolling meadows and woodland, truly majestic in its beauty. Nature herself contributed to the castle's defenses. In the west, this sandstone bluff was the site of Warwick's original stockade and tower. The Avon provides power for the mill and a permanent barrier against aggressors from the south. William the Conqueror wouldn't recognize Warwick's contemporary face. For seven centuries, the battling giant evolved to withstand improved weapons and tactics. This is the wooden fortress William the Conqueror erected in 1068 using local lumber. Within two centuries, stone replaced wood and a high wall surrounded the keep. Mighty twin towers rose in the east, protecting the gatehouse and its massive drawbridge. By the 16th century, improved artillery called for thicker walls and generally increased girth. During the English Civil War, apartments in the south housed royalty who were loyal to parliament. Meanwhile, royalists lay siege to the ramparts outside. By then, the fighting castle hosted an army of defenders and provisions for months of battle. And with cannon ports and towers of its own, Warwick could trade blows with even the best armed foe. Using castles like Warwick, William the Conqueror tamed battling factions of the British Isles. He then held them together with a tightly ordered system of feudalism, which bound vassals to regional lords and lords to their king. William's network of castles was the backbone of his power structure, but its heart was knighthood. Knights were mounted warriors who provided lords with military service in exchange for land. The brotherhood was bound by the code of chivalry, which called for courtesy towards women, loyalty to God, and military virtue. Like the memories of an old crusader, relics from a thousand campaigns adorn Warwick's halls.
The castle's largest room is the Great Hall, where the Earls of Warwick administered their vast holdings and held councils of war. A bear and staff have marked their coat of arms since the time of Arthgillis, a knight of King Arthur's Round Table. The bear embraces an uprooted tree, allegedly used by an ancient Earl of Warwick to slay a giant. These gleaming suits of armor come from Germany and Italy, as well as the British Isles. The 11th century Norman invasion hastened the development of armor in England. Throughout the medieval age, the parts of the suit were called by their original French names. Warwick contains a thousand pieces of arms and armor. Virtually every lance, sword, and shield here played some part in charting England's course. The owners of this equipment include giants of English history, like Lord Oliver Cromwell and Charles Edward Stuart, known as Bonnie Prince Charlie. But no lord or pretender can evoke the spirit of romantic knighthood like the legendary hero, Sir Guy of Warwick. Guy began as a page in the service of an Earl of Warwick. He was low-born and unworthy to court Felice, the Earl's daughter. Yet Felice captured his heart. So Guy set out to make a name for himself in the surrounding lands of Warwickshire. Like many knights, Guy competed valiantly in festival tournaments, contests in which knights honed their martial skills. These tournaments were organized and hosted by regional lords. In tournament competition, their knights could bring honor to their houses and earn money for themselves. Typically, the winner of jousting competitions could claim the horse and weaponry of those he defeated. Often, he could demand a ransom of the vanquished as well. <laughs> Professional knights like Guy traveled from one tournament to another throughout England and the continent, earning glory and a small fortune. Competing in tournaments was also a good way to catch the eye of the ladies of the court. Sometimes it was a good way to get killed. The weapons were never blunted. Many noblemen lost their lives. Guy, however, prevailed and proved to be England's mightiest warrior. He turned his attention to ridding Warwickshire of the cutthroats and thieves that plagued the Earl of Warwick's domain. Next, Guy wielded his mighty sword against monsters that terrorized the local peasants. This statue at Warwick shows Guy doing battle with the most fearsome of these creatures, the demonic Dun Cow of Dunchurch. Time Guy slew this beast, his chronicles of valor far outweighed the lowly station to which he was born. When he asked for Felice's hand, she consented to be his bride. When Felice's father died, Guy was dubbed Earl of Warwick. This enormous cauldron is called Guy's porridge pot. Legend suggests it was used to make prodigious meals for Warwick's new Earl. However, settled life didn't suit the adventurous knight. Raising his own army, he set sail for Jerusalem to rescue the Holy Land from heathen invaders. His crusade lasted more than a decade. By the time Guy returned to Warwick, he was a tired, broken man. Years of killing had blunted his appetite for life. He resolved to be a knight no more.
donning beggar's rags, Guy went to live in the cave of a monk not far from Warwick. There he began a life of prayer. The beautiful Felice knew nothing of Guy's return or his vows of poverty and repentance. At Warwick, she waited year after year, unaware that he languished just a few miles away. Once to lay eyes on his beloved again, Sir Guy appeared at the castle gate and received alms from his lady. Felice failed to recognize him. Guy decided never to return. But on the day he knew his death would come, the Earl of Warwick summoned his wife with a letter. In it, he enclosed his wedding ring as proof of his identity. Felice was overcome. She rushed to the cave. Sir Guy of Warwick died in her arms. Though Sir Guy exists mostly in legend, his adventures have blended over the centuries with the stories of several of Warwick's real-life earls. Many of these heroic figures are entombed in nearby St. Mary's Chapel. This is an effigy of Ambrose Dudley, both the son and brother of earls of Warwick. This is Richard Beecham, 13th Earl of Warwick, one of five earls from the Beecham family. Richard, who designed and endowed St. Mary's Chapel, was a friend to Henry V and a gallant warrior. Few could match his skill with a sword and lance. Like Sir Guy, he was known to have visited the Holy Lands. Near the end of his life, he presided over Joan of Arc's trial and execution. By the time Richard Beecham's line died out in 1446, William the Conqueror's plans for England were in motion. His feudal system of castle-dwelling lords had pulled the nation together, protecting it from foreign invasion. In relative peace, England began to catch up to the continent in government, religion, and the arts. As always, Warwick's earls took a leading role in the nation's ongoing drama. When the Thirty-Year War of the Roses broke out between rivals for England's crown, Warwick Castle was in the thick of it. The houses of York and Lancaster both laid claim to the throne. Their badges were the White and Red Rose, respectively, giving their bloody contest its name. Into this maelstrom was born Richard of the House of York. His single-minded pursuit of the throne was immortalized, with dramatic license, in Shakespeare's history, Richard III. Richard, portrayed here beneath his badge, remains England's most controversial king. As Shakespeare tells it, Richard came upon his crown through violence and deception. After the death of his brother, the king, he hides his two nephews in the infamous Tower of London, ostensibly for their own protection. Like Warwick, the tower was founded by William the Conqueror. Both of the imprisoned boys are in line for the throne ahead of Richard, and hence not long for this world, poisoned by their villainous uncle. History is less certain about the fate of the 13-year-old King Edward V and his brother, remembered as the two princes of the tower. But history does record that by 1483, Richard III was King of England. All other claimants dispatched one way or another. The new king often retreated from treacherous London to the safe embrace of mighty Warwick Castle. Accompanying him at all times was his own personal guard, who occupied Warwick and made camp in the surrounding lands of Warwickshire. This precaution was necessary, for Richard had many enemies. Of course, the House of Lancaster wanted his head, but so did his former supporters. Not even his own army could be entirely trusted. The people of Warwickshire, too, would have received Richard's arrival with misgivings. The last Earl of Warwick had died fighting Richard at the Battle of Barnet, by one account impaled on Richard's lance. 
Later, Richard had strengthened his hold on the dead Earl's lands and peasantry by marrying his eldest daughter, Anne Neville. Political maneuverings of this sort add to a portrait of a king whose journey to the throne was steeped in controversy. The defensive features of Warwick came to reflect the strength of the enemies Richard made along the way. Approaching armies could be spotted by lookouts high atop the two defending towers. Here on Caesar's Tower, archers could pick off attackers from these gaps called embrasures. Arrow slits offered even more protection. Defenders also fired through crosses cut in the merlots. Richard added this defensive perch called a crow's nest. Warwick's mighty gatehouse was almost impossible to break through. In fact, throughout medieval times, the castle was virtually impervious to capture. Yet a number of antagonists were willing to try. Within Warwick's ramparts, Richard was safe from his enemy's armies. Yet his own garrison was infested with spies. The castle provided several means for dealing with them. This door, called a sally port, gets its name from its usefulness in reconnoitering an enemy's position. From here, a friendly lookout could sally forth. It was also useful for getting rid of unwelcome guests. That's enough! In. Almost any fate was better than ending up here, in Warwick's dungeon, the final destination for many prisoners. Some were held for ransom or persuaded to reveal strategic secrets. The dank, vaulted chamber contains a grisly assortment of torture instruments, including a Roman rack and a horrible device called the scavenger's daughter. Perhaps the worst fate was being sealed up for good in the oubliette, in French, place to be forgotten. On August 7th, 1485, Richard's reign drew to a close. The army of Henry Tudor, the Lancastrian claimant to the throne, landed in Wales. They numbered just 2,000 men. But on the march from central Wales to Shrewsbury, which took two weeks, they drew additional forces from the ranks of Lancaster loyalists. Henry had alerted them far in advance. Upon their arrival at Sutton Cheney in western Leicestershire, Henry Tudor's army was 5,000 strong. The invasion had not caught Richard unawares. On the 21st of August, assured of victory, his army of 12,000 gathered at Leicester. A third army, controlled by Lord Thomas and Sir William Stanley, watched what proceeded at a distance. The Stanleys favored Henry Tudor, but the ever-prudent Richard had taken Thomas Stanley's son hostage. He was assured of the Stanleys' cooperation. At Bosworth Field on August 22nd, the vanguard of Henry and Richard's armies clashed at dawn. 
Richard's superior numbers seemed certain to carry the day, but Henry's foot soldiers repelled their first charge. Richard's side suffered heavy losses, including their battle commander, the Duke of Norfolk. At the height of the struggle, Henry, with a 50-man escort, raced toward the Stanley army to entreat them to join his fight against the king. Richard saw his chance to end the Lancaster rivalry once and for all. He charged down on Henry with 900 soldiers. Finally, the Stanleys chose sides. 3,000 men came to Henry Tudor's aid. In the fray, the king himself killed unknown numbers, including Sir William Brandon, Henry's standard bearer. Fighting was over by 10 a.m. 900 lay dead, among them Richard III. At a place now called Crown Hill, Henry Tudor stripped Richard's corpse of the crown of England. Lord Thomas Stanley proclaimed him king. Thus, the powerful Tudor dynasty was born and would keep the throne for more than a century. According to many accounts, Richard's body was unceremoniously dumped into a river, there perhaps to pass by the mighty castle that could no longer protect him. In fact, Richard was buried without honors at the Church of the Grey Friars in Leicester. Warwick remained in the crown's possession for a hundred years more until King Edward VI granted the castle and title to John Dudley, Duke of Northumberland. A century later, all the castle's defenses were put to the test when the English Civil War broke out. For two weeks, cannon fire tore at Warwick's ramparts, leaving scars that remain today. Eventually, the royalists withdrew, and the castle was saved. Many other mighty fortresses weren't so lucky. This is the ruin of nearby Kenilworth Castle. Like Warwick, Kenilworth was founded by William the Conqueror. During the Civil War, parliamentarians seized the castle. Fearing that the mighty fortress would later be wielded against them, they chose to disable it. With gunpowder, they blew up the outer wall of the keep, then demolished most of the structures within. More than once in its history, Warwick could have suffered this fate. But the castle had the good fortune to survive mostly by virtue of the intimidating visage it presented to would-be attackers. Today, Warwick is owned by Madame Tussauds of London. It's threatened now only by friendly armies of tourists. Like an old soldier, it regales them with tales of medieval grandeur and helps them relive, for a moment, its fighting past.